All right, we're at the top of the hour. We'll go ahead and get started. Again, welcome to the uh, media to our second of the four Pac-12 football coaches media webinars. Uh, again, Yogi, uh, Pac-12 analyst, will host the three coaches. Uh, uh, some questions, some topics, and national issues will be discussed for the first 15 minutes. Then the second 15 minutes, we'll take questions from the media. Uh, again, media, when we get to that point, I'll prompt you to select the raised hand tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to put you in the queue and we'll get the questions asked of the coaches. So at this time, Yogi, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. And uh, thanks for the, all the coaches for joining us uh, every day. As you said, we're gonna have a different theme. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, we were just talking before we came on air about how everybody's operating in this world. So before we get to the football, I wanna ask each of you, what part of your shelter in place have you come to appreciate the most? Coach Whittingham, we'll start with you. Oh, boy, I would say just uh, the opportunity to uh, see the grandkids more often. I know, you know, we're not, you know, we've kind of kept it, you know, we're doing our part with the rules and regulations, but, but uh, you know, being around the grandkids a little bit more has been a big positive for me. Nice. Coach Terrell? I would say similar to what Kyle uh, said, but my daughter, who is in college, she's a senior at Auburn. And I haven't seen her very much the last few years, but obviously with this shelter in place, she's at home. So just getting a chance to see all the family together at one spot is that's been rare for the Durrells for a long time. And, but it's, uh, it's fun to have them at home. Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, probably echo the same thing. I mean, for me, it's just all the family time and waking up. I think this is the most, the most times I've actually woke up in my house and had a cup of coffee and was able to watch my kids rise out of bed this many consecutive days in a row. And, uh, you know, watching movies, playing board games, which we usually do in the month of July, but now we've been able to do, you know, almost for two months now. So I definitely appreciate the, uh, the family time. I love that. Okay. Well, I know all of us on this call, we appreciate football and we want it back just like you guys all do. Uh, Coach Whittingham, I want to start with you and I want to ask this one to everybody. How have you been able to attempt to recapture your competitive edge with everything that you've lost? And of course, for Carl and Jimmy, like you guys haven't even had a practice yet as a new head coach within your organization. How have you recaptured that edge or began to try to recapture that edge or build it within your respective programs? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, obviously, being remote and everyone being out of town, you know, all the, all the players are at their, you know, their homes or, you know, throughout the country. And so, uh, you know, we're just taking advantage of what the NC2A allows, you know, the eight hours of Zoom meetings a week. We have, uh, team meetings, unit meetings, position meetings, special teams. I and mean, we're hitting all areas and doing everything we can there. Uh, our strength coaches, I feel, have done a great job of, of getting the kids uh, the workouts and, 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 you know, being able to, to uh, you know, get them, you know, up to speed on that. And, and our guys, you know, from what we're gathering, they're doing a great job of working out. Of course, it's all on the honor system and, and uh, hoping that uh, things are going well. But it appears like we're, you know, doing everything we can. Uh, we were able to get three practices in, which is you know better than nothing. But but we certainly could have used them all, just like everybody else. And particularly when you're looking for a new starting quarterback and you're replacing, you know, eight or nine starters on defense, we could have you know really used the spring ball. Just but everyone's got the same you know circumstances. Everyone uh, you know has things to work on. But but uh, I think we're doing about as uh, you know at least in our estimation as good a job as we can with what we uh, what we have available. Oh, Sherelle. Yeah, I would say very similar to what Kyle said. It's, you know, the, the challenge that we, probably Jimmy and I are the same, where we haven't had any chance to, to do any practices. But for me, I haven't even been in this program um, before as an assistant or whatever for quite some time. So, you know, Kyle was talking about, you know, you're looking at some new positions and co competitions and stuff like that. I think in my mind, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, 22 positions <laughs> just because they're all new. I have no eyes on them, you know, all those things. So my eyes will be wide open once that time comes. Uh, we get a chance to do some stuff on the field. But, you know, but other than that, you know, we're, we're doing our eight hour uh, care rules with our meetings and virtual meetings and installs. You know, the strength and conditioning people are, you know, doing what they can. And, you know, we're you know, we're being patient in the process right now. So we didn't, we didn't, we don't even talk about spring practice since it never really occurred. But so everybody really, you know, you have to let that go and just try to look forward to what's in front of us now. Yeah. And Coach Lake, you, you know, you're known as an aggressive defensive mindset. Uh, you like to, you know, in air quotes, kind of go for it. How have you been able to do that 
via Zoom with your team amid the times we're in? Yeah. No, it's been a challenge. I think, thankfully, uh, January through the middle of March, we really had a really good start uh, in our, you know, off-season conditioning program with uh, Tim Saha and his strength and conditioning, and conditioning staff. And um, he did a lot of new things, put some new wrinkles in the workouts, got some competitive features um, that I think the guys were really juiced about and they were excited about. And so I think, uh, if anything, now it's kind of fueled the fire a little bit where these guys are just chomping at the bit to come back. And you know, we've done just like, uh, the, you know, uh, Kyle and, and Carl just said, we've done the Zoom meetings and, you know, reinforce everything we had talked about in the beginning of the year. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, our team is going to be extremely grateful uh, when we do come back and they can't wait to get back into a, a regular meeting with, with human beings uh, surrounding them and, and, and going out and doing a walkthrough and doing a practice. So right now, you know, I, I just think it's building the fire in these guys and um, they're going to have a lot of energy when we get back and roll them. Yeah. Co- Coach Rill, speaking of kind of connecting with players, right about how you had a 10 minute meeting with every player on the roster, right when you got there, but now like, how creative are you getting in trying to get to know guys a little bit deeper than in a position group or a team meeting on zoom, if you are. Well, you, you do have to, you know, still build those relationships, you know, along the way I do select a, you know, a group of players to try to reach out to every week, you know, on the team, just to have some specific information, you know, hello, what's going on? You know, how are school going? We just finished finals. So, uh, you know, we're trying to get grades back from that. So it was a lot of encouragement that, you know, what message that I was telling most of the guys uh, that I've been connecting with, but uh, the 10 minute meeting was just really an icebreaker, you know, just to kind of, I'm the new coach, you know, you're the new, you know, we're, we're in this thing together, that type of thing. But, I think lately since the Zoom meetings, our, our coaches have done a great job with their meetings, but I've tried to pick off a few guys here and there just to create a, you know, a connection, you know, so to speak, this, this communication, just kind of introducing myself to things that we do, um, you know, because we're, you know, I'm the one that's new, you know, that's, that's the challenge that they're all trying to, you know, gain the confidence in me and, and, and me gaining their trust and stuff like that from the other side of it. Coach Whittingham, uh, you referenced having to replace all the guys that went to the league on the defensive side, obviously one of the most efficient quarterbacks in the country last year, let alone your running back. How, how are you now with the state of Utah kind of figuring out and putting the pieces together when you can actually even get back into the building and can you shed some light on when guys will be able to come in, even if in small groups? Yeah, that's still a, a pretty fluid situation. We don't have any definitive answers, but, but uh, you know, there is some talk about maybe June 1 getting, uh, you know, introducing small groups back into the weight room. You know, we'll see if that comes to fruition. But right now there's nothing concrete. We're just playing it by ear each day and, and uh, getting the updates each day. And, uh, you know, if we are able to get back in the weight room June 1, even on a limited basis, that would be great. But, but that remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, Coach Lake, um, Seattle's kind of been an epicenter for this. Um, it's also become an epicenter in college football, especially for young quarterbacks who want a chance to play. You got three guys, <laughs> two have never taken a snap. How, how are you communicating and even planning to organize that position and the competition within those three QBs? Yeah, you know, again, thankfully, um, you know, John Donovan, our new offensive coordinator, quarterback coach, spent some time with the the two guys you mentioned, Jacob Sermon, Dylan Morris, you know, January through the middle of March. So he was able to, you know, they were coming up volunteer meetings. They were able to talk and kind of get through some of the basics. Uh, So at least we had something there, a a little positive, uh, you know, momentum going towards, okay, here's what we're doing. But, you know, after that, it's just been all Zoom meetings. Uh, You know, Coach Donovan hasn't seen one of these guys throw live. And uh, it'll definitely be a challenge, but we're all, we all have challenges right now. What I am excited about is I think all three guys, the third guy being Ethan Garbers, who joined us in, in spring quarter. Um, I think they're all talented. I think they're all hungry. I think they're all competitive um, young athletes. And so I know they're excited to learn the offense and uh, get out there and compete. And like I tell the whole team, I'm an equal opportunity employer. Whoever shows they know, they know the scheme and they can, uh, uh, get out there and practice and, and make plays or be a, are going to be the ones that uh, uh, get the opportunity to do it on game day. And so I think all those, all three of those guys are going to create a, a really good competition in that room. Yeah. I cannot wait to see how that plays out. Co- Coach, what you referenced, you had a few practices. How many times have you gone back and watched that film just to overanalyze <laughs> that position? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've worn that tape out, but 
it was good to get on the field. You know, some is better than none, obviously. But but uh, we got a you know a glimpse of uh, the three quarterbacks that are battling for the job: uh, Cam Rising, Jake Bentley, and Drew List. Those those guys are going to be the ones that are in the hunt. Uh, you know, and come fall camp, uh, whenever that transpires, we got to get that narrowed down to two right away. You know, so we'll have three going in that uh, are in the mix, but but we've got to get that to two uh, fairly quickly, and then. You know, ideally, two weeks out from the opener, you could decide on a guy and, and uh, go from there. Excellent. C- Coach Jarrell, um, I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, you spent so much time in the NFL where endorsements are a plenty, right? Name, image, and likeness is getting a, you know, a lot of play right now in all of college football, college athletics. A lot of it's because we don't have anything else to really talk about necessarily. H- how do you view recruiting and the landscape now coming into college from the league where you've seen guys – deal with endorsements and now you may be around guys who literally are going to potentially have some endorsements. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. You're, you're right. It's, you know, that's, that's a hot topic that goes into effect next, next year in 2021. Right. So um, I, I would say it, from a, it's going to be a smaller scale aspect of things from the, from an NCAA standpoint. Uh, I think there's there'll be some parameters as to how that works. We don't really know what that is yet. Um, I know that you know it goes into effect in January, I guess next year. But um, I think it's a good thing. You know, it's it's it'll be a positive thing for our players. Uh, you know, when it's all said and done, uh, I, I I don't think it can be. Uh, you know, in the NFL, it's it's pretty more widespread where there's a number of things and all sorts of different areas of life uh, where you can get these types of endorsements. I think there'll be some restrictions, I would assume, you know, on a college level. So it's really, uh, you know, it, it's uncharted territory for the, for the college level, but uh, I'm sure there'll be some parameters with it. I think it will be a good thing when it's all said and done and we'll just see how it works out as it, as it gets, as it moves forward. Yeah, such an interesting time, just fundamentally in college athletics. Jimmy, I'm curious for you on the recruiting front, what has it been like with so much happening, so much uncertainty, health and wellness, uh, name, image, and likeness, et cetera, that I'm sure you're hearing as you're talking to young kids? Yeah, no, it is. Uh, it's an interesting time right now. And, uh, you know, the, the name, image, and image, and not likeness really hasn't come up uh, too much just because I don't think the, you know, the law has passed just yet. Um, I think the challenges where we're all having right now is, you know, not having those unofficial visitors and official visitors that we would normally have on campus right now. Um, but I think our creative team has, has done an unbelievable job of trying to pump out uh, stuff, you know, through social media to, to show the potential prospects what it would be like to come to the University of Washington and kind of give them, a, you know, at least a glimpse of, you know, what it's like to come out of the tunnel through that purple smoke into Husky Stadium and, and also what it would be like to be a, to be a student athlete on campus. So, uh, but we all have those challenges right now, and, and we're just trying to trying to show them that glimpse through uh, through a computer screen right now. Yeah, well, Coach Witt, uh, the country got to see a glimpse of your program with the draft a couple weeks ago. W- what has that been like in recruiting? What have you felt from all the success that your guys have had when they got picked up over the course of those three days? Yeah, well, it certainly helps. I mean, any any positive things going on in your program is uh, you know you try to translate that to recruiting right away. And we were fortunate to have seven guys drafted and uh, another five priority free agents. So we got 12 of our, I think it was 16 seniors we had this year, you know, in camps with the opportunity. And, and uh, you know, that's a big selling point to recruits. And obviously, you know, recruits coming out of high school, you know, they want an education. They want to have a chance to play in the NFL. And so that's, that's something that uh, we try to uh, let them know there's a great opportunity for that if they come to Utah. Yeah. Um, Coach, I remember uh, the opportunity you got to become the head coach at Utah. I was there the day when you got introduced to take over for Urban Meyer. Jimmy Lake has taken over for Chris Peterson. Carl Durrell is now back in the conference as a head coach. What would you give both of these guys regarding some advice of either taking over for a Hall of Fame coach or now coming back to this conference? Yeah, well, I'm not sure either one of them need any of my advice. But but uh, what I can say and what, what I did is, is – uh, you know, when Urban was here, we obviously had great success. And so you want to put your own stamp on the program, but don't be afraid to hang on to what's working already. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things going on at both programs. I mean, Chris Peterson, I think, is one of the best coaches in the country. And uh, so there's a lot that's right. Hang on to that stuff. Don't be, uh, you know, don't change just for the sake of change. You know, change what you want to change and what you think needs changing. Put your stamp on it. 
but don't be afraid to hang on to uh, to what's been successful. And we did a great deal of that we hung on to a bunch of urban stuff, and and to this day still employ a lot of uh, what he brought to the program. Uh, so well said. Um, I know there's a ton of people that would like to ask a bunch of questions now, but I can't wait to get with you guys because I can only imagine what a roundtable will be like when we're in person. Hopefully that is sometime soon. I don't know when, uh, but thank you for your time. Dave, I'll turn it back over to you as we bring in members of the media to ask questions for the remaining 15 minutes. All right. Thanks, Yogi. Um, again, if you have a question, please select the raise hand tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, then I will allow you to ask the question when I call on you. The first one will be Brian Howe. Go ahead, Brian. Your line may be muted. Yeah, this is for Coach Terrell. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, Coach, two questions for you. First off, I was curious how you've been able to connect with your staff, which was really just kind of put in place right before all this shutdown. Uh, if there's been positives, negatives to that. And then also I wanted to uh, see if you could tell me about uh, the quarterback competition and what you've learned about Tyler and Brendan and Sam throughout this process. Uh, the, yeah, sure. The, the first question with the staff, you know, that's, that's actually a, you know, there are some, there are some really good coaches I was able to hire that I had some background with. Um, so there was a, there's a number of coaches from that standpoint that the transition has been, uh, fairly, fairly smooth. Uh, it is what we would expect. There's, there's some that I've retained and, and, and I think they're really good coaches as well. Um, but I think you like, what we're all been discussing lately, we're all working remotely. We haven't had a chance to really have a lot of staff time to really iron out really the organizational procedures and how that is. We've talked about it, but it's different when you're talking about it and doing things from a remote sense and not really being collectively in one room and working things out and giving descriptions and examples and stuff like that when they're all together. So, you know, that's, that's always going to be the, the newness of a staff is just going to, going to, take some tweaking and getting used to and these circumstances have slowed a little bit of that process but uh, but other than that I'm, I've been very pleased with with what they've been able to do I've been in their zoom meetings with their players uh, so I've got really good teachers and you know, that's really the first and foremost is I want good teachers and and I think we're getting our information conveyed to our to our student athletes uh, as it pertains to the quarterback position you know Sam is you know, we, we had to recruit him to come back. He's already graduated and, and he was uh, getting ready to be a grad transfer somewhere else and we, we got him to stay. So we ended up losing one of our quarterbacks right after the end of this season, right prior uh, to Mel Tucker leaving. Uh, so we had one transfer out and then we had one come in in January with, with Brendan, who, as you mentioned, and, and then Tyler, who's the one that's been here. He'll be a junior this year. So um, all three of those guys, if you, if you, when you put it all, when it's all said and done, haven't had much time. Obviously, the freshman hasn't had it down. You know, Tyler has not played very much. He probably played less than 20 snaps all season. And then you have Sam, who was actually playing at the safety position when they moved him uh, prior to coming back and playing quarterback now. So it's really a wide open position. Uh, we're coaching them all hard. Uh, and we're just going to see how the thing really falls in place when we get a chance to, to line up at the beginning of the season, but we, we have a long way to go still. Okay, uh, your next question will come from Wesley Ruff. Go ahead, Wesley. Hi, uh, it's actually Dana. I guess I'm logged in under Wes. I, Coach Witt, I can't uh, escape uh, Wes's shadow, I guess. <laughs> um, couple questions for you, Coach Witt. Um, first of all, there's been the idea of playing an 11 game uh, regular season against all Pac-12 opponents. What do you think of that? And then what do you think of the possibility of uh, playing without fans? It may have to become a necessary part of uh, modern day sports. Well, yeah, uh, you know, right now, obviously there's, uh, you know, all options are on the table and we've got uh, all kinds of things we've talked about uh, as, you know, as a, as a conference and, and uh, the other conferences are doing the same thing. So I think there's uh, a lot of questions that have to be answered. First of all, I mean, the ideal situation is we start on time, we play the normal schedule and got fans in the stands and away you go. Uh, I think the odds are probably against that. But uh, if it comes to uh, playing a conference schedule, then, you know, we're all in. And that's, a, you know, if that's what it takes to, uh, you know, to get the season in and, and get things done in the best fashion possible, then then, uh, you know, that's what we go with. But I think we're still uh, several weeks out from, from having any real concrete direction on, 
on uh, you know what's going to happen and how things are going to be set up. But but uh, that is certainly one of the possibilities. Now I haven't heard of an 11 game. You know we've heard a 10 game model and a nine game model. I guess there's nothing wrong with with an 11 game model if you if you have the the time frame. My you know one of my big uh, issues is trying to avoid playing games during finals. I think that's tough on the student athletes and and I know we have bowl prep during finals and so forth. That's a whole different ball game than than getting ready for an actual game that week. And so uh, you know I think we're going to try our best to get as many games as we can and uh, we'll see what happens. But like I said, there's so much unknown and so much uh, uh, fluidness to the situation that uh, there really is it's pointless to really try to pinpoint any one uh, direction that we're going to go. It's going to have to wait and see and, and uh, go from there. Okay, your next question will come from Troy Rink. For, um, go ahead, Troy, your line is open. And Troy? Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry there you about go. That. Coach Durrell, when you – your experience from being at CU should help, but how long do you think it would prepare a college team to get ready for a season, having gone through training camp in the NFL with professionals? What do you think is realistic in terms of preparing a group, especially a group that didn't have the advantage of spring practice? Well, good question. Um, you know, the NFL is different. You know, they, it's a much longer process, what they do in the off season that starts um, – in general, let's say the, the third week of April is when everyone comes back into their organizations, talking about the players, and there's a two-week period of just strength and conditioning where the coaches have no time with them, and then they, it gradually builds into practice time. So it's a, it's a longer process of when they get ready to play. Um, that process runs from their, from their OTA period through mid-June, and then they take a break and come back in training camp the latter part of July. So you know, you're asking me a time frame, you know, it's, it's given the situation we're in right now, I think it's more ideal, you know, we, since we haven't had much time with our players with hands-on uh, supervision is my, I'm, I might be the only one that feels this way, but I think it's an eight week process. You know, it's, it's given the status that we're in is, you know, I, I like to have a month of training and conditioning to kind of get them in shape and then the month of training camp and then play the, you know, play the game, but it's when it comes down to it. But I don't think we're going to get anything close to that. You know, I know that we're, it's going to be a little bit faster process, but um, I think we're given the, the circumstances in this season and, and what we're dealing with. I think all of us coaches feel we're, whatever time they give us, we'll be appreciative of it and we'll just make the most of it. You know, and I think that's really how I, my mindset is. But if I had my druthers, I'd say I want an eight week process, you know, before that first game. Okay, next question will come from Larry Stone. Go ahead, Larry, your line is open. Yeah, this is for, for Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, you have the unique situation of being a first-time head coach. Uh, you must be just anxious to put your stamp on things, and uh, how tough has it been in that regard, you know, just not getting that chance to, to, to coach with, with the first chance as a head coach? Yeah, you know, it's definitely a challenge, but uh, thankfully, you know, I've been here going on seven years now and, um, you know, especially on the defensive, defensive side of the ball, these guys have heard my voice over and over and over. And I know on the offensive side of the ball, they've also heard me in a different, in a different fashion, but you know, all these recruit, all the, the our players here, uh, I was in the recruiting process with almost all, every single one of them. Um, they know me, they, they know my personality. So I feel like um, in that regard, um, you know, there's a lot of positives there. But definitely, you know, and uh, you know, going through spring football practice would have been a would have been a, a huge deal, you know, for our program and, and for me as a, as a new head football coach. Um, I am fortunate; I've been around a, a lot of great head coaches, uh, like Kyle mentioned. I mean, Chris Peterson, who I think is uh, the best uh, college football coach I've ever been around, and you know, I've also had some NFL experiences with some some really great head coaches. And um, so I'll be able to lean on those experiences and um, just uh, chomping at the bit to, to get these guys back here. All right, names. Next question will come from James Crepia. James, go ahead. Your line is open. Guys, uh, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, you're all chomping at the bit and, and certainly us in the media are as well. Uh, but not much has been said by or on behalf of players in this equation. And certainly they don't have a union or anything like the pros do. 
if a player or their family is not comfortable returning to campus or they have an underlying medical condition or I think two of you have international players if they're unable to return to campus due to travel restrictions or something, how do you approach that situation and what's the status of their scholarship with your program? Who are you asking that question to? Anybody? All of them. All, of them. <laughs> all right, well, I'll just chime in. Uh, you know, first of all, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that, uh, that arise that uh, probably haven't even been thought of yet, that uh, hurdles that we've got to get over. And, and uh, you know, in answer to your question about if there's underlying medical conditions, I mean, obviously the safety of the athlete is first and foremost. And so if we go into this thing and there's not a vaccine in place or, you know, there's, like I said, there's so many variables that you can't, I don't know if we can really adequately answer that question at this time, but, but I think that, uh, you know, I can safely speak for all three of us that the, the student athletes welfare and their, their safety is first and foremost. And, and uh, I don't think anybody's interested in putting them in harm's way in any way, shape or form. And, and uh, so that'll be job one. Uh, as far as the travel and getting people here, that'll probably be a, a challenge as well. I mean, you know, who, who knows how much lead time we're going to have before we get the go ahead. And, and you're right. We have some players from Australia uh, and England as well. And so that'll be uh, something that we've got to, you know, get ironed out, but, but uh, kind of like most of the questions we fielded, I mean, there's just so many things that uh, have yet to be determined. It's hard to give you a concrete answer on that. Yeah, the other coaches. I, I would diddle that too. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think we're, we're living each day really day by day in terms of the information we get and, but I, I, like Kyle said, we're going to, obviously our safety comes first. You're going to be uh, very cognizant of that. You know, all the conditions, uh, the health conditions of our team, uh, our staff, you know, those are, that's part of it too. So, um, but I know that, you know, we're, we're being governed in the right place. And, and I know that, uh, you know, if and when those times come, when we have the deadlines of things to, to report to and when we can do things, uh, we can be a little bit more definitive, but uh, right now it's, it's living it day by day. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with, with both coaches. The biggest thing is it's the safety of the players and our staff is number one. And so if someone has an issue with an underlying condition of getting back here, I mean, we're going to deal with that appropriately. It's going to be nothing about trying to get them here for a meeting and that takes precedent over, over, over their safety. So um, safety first for, for all of our personnel here. All right, next question will come from Mike Varell. Go ahead, Mike, your line is open. Hey guys, um, I just wanna ask for, for, uh, for Jimmy and Kyle. I know Carl talked about this, but just you know, with a ramp up or an extended fall camp or whatever that may be, what do you feel like your team would need to be ready? What would be kind of the ideal scenario for that? Well, we've talked as uh, coaches uh, you know, in the conference, and I think that the, pretty, the sentiment is pretty much uh, six weeks would be a minimum. I think that's uh, something that uh, we could live with. Uh, if we're presented with less than that, then we've got to adjust accordingly. But but when you look at it, uh, you know, just discount spring ball, take that out of the equation. The typical lead-in is eight weeks of training in the summer, four weeks of fall camp before you play, or camp and then leading into the season. So you've got 12 weeks there. So so if we could get half that, I think that would be uh, great if we can get that done. And, and uh, you know, that seems to be the consensus uh, among the rest of the coaches as well as, as a six six week leading would be uh, would be adequate. Yeah, Mike, I think I mean we would all want more time. Like Carl mentioned, I mean eight weeks would be would be would be great, and anything more than that would be obviously uh, going in the positive direction. Uh, but did we have all talked as as coaches that six weeks would be a minimum? Um, you know, get these guys two weeks of just getting in condition for one, and then start implementing our schemes and going through meetings. Um, so on and so forth. So I think uh, six weeks has been agreed upon uh, would be uh, at a minimum uh, the best for our guys. All right, next question will come from Kelly Lyle. Go ahead, Kelly, your line is open. Yeah, this is uh, for Coach Durrell. Carl, just wondering with the um, thought and this talk of six weeks and all, if it came down to it and you had to choose between playing those three non-conference games and only getting maybe three or four weeks to get your team ready or having that full six weeks and playing conference only schedule, what would be your thoughts on that? What would be your preference? Uh, say that again. Uh, say the, the last part of that question. 
If, if you had to choose between playing those three non-conference games and maybe not getting an extra two or three weeks of practice to get that six that you would like, would you rather just play the schedule as is with only three or four weeks of prep? Or would, do you really want that, feel that six weeks is necessary? And if you lose the non-conference portion of the season and go conference only, that'd be your preference. Okay. I, I think the six weeks is what you need, regardless of whatever schedule you have, uh, whether it's a 10 game schedule or 12 game schedule, I think you still need that prep time. Um, I, I would say like, like what Jimmy said, that's, that's, that's at the minimum in my, from my standpoint is, is, you know, six weeks is a, is a, is a, is a good amount of time, but you know, we wouldn't want to be anything less than that. Um, and then I would just work the season back from there. So right now we're all anticipating having a full season where, you know, we're starting uh, beginning of September and we're hoping that, you know, the six week process backs up from when your first game uh, date is and, and then you're away you go from there. So I'm not, I'm not interested in losing just because of, uh, you know, losing games and, and because I'm, I'm, I'm down to a, a month of preparation, I still, I think as a coaching group, we still want to play as many games as we can. And I think we would do it with whatever time frame they give us to do it. We're just merely making suggestions as to what is the proper amount of time for the preparation. So uh, we don't want to lose any games for sure. All right. Final question will come from Leo Haggerty. Go ahead, Leo. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. The demographics of Salt Lake City and Boulder are totally different than Seattle. From a competitive balance, does the conference have to say everybody starts together? Or if Utah and Colorado can start two weeks before Washington, is that okay? And I, I want to hear from all coaches. Coach Lake first. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, you know, I, that's a, that's a great question, Leo. Um, you know, I'm of the opinion it would be great if the whole NCAA made a blanket rule for the whole nation of when we would start. And I, you know, I understand some states may be, uh, you know, less hit by this um, than most. And I'm sure there's going to be some different opinions after me. But, um, you know, in my opinion, I believe the NCAA should step in and say, okay, here's the date where everybody can start. Uh, because obviously we have a non-conference game to start off. If they're able to, to practice, you know, two months before we we were able to practice, um, that's that's a disadvantage. And not even you know, not even talking about Utah or Colorado, just our, our first game that we're that we're uh, slated to play. Uh, so that's what I, that's what I would be for. Um, and and then I think we would be all on an even playing field. I think the NFL is also going through the same same issue right now. Some states are opening up before others. And I've heard a couple of NFL head coaches also have the same sentiment. Go ahead, Carl. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think in general, I feel the same way Jimmy does. I think there should be a, a blanket start as to when that six week process or whatever time frame it is to prepare for your, for your season. I think there should be, um, you know, the NCAA should, should govern that. Um, in terms of the open, when things are opening from one, you know, state to another, I think that's usually involving just, uh, I would say, the the normal NCAA guidelines of care hours or whatever you would normally do. Wouldn't, I mean, I, I've I've made this proposition for the for the for the group last week about let's say if Colorado did open up and we're we're able to work out, um, that's still a, a governing time of just training. Uh, stuff that he's, we're getting supervision for. I mean, I'm be, I would be in favor of that. And I think from a conference perspective, if there's schools that couldn't do that, uh, where they were still out, where they couldn't come back on campus, I would, I would try to get it legislated for where, you know, those, those campuses can have virtual, you know, supervision for, for workouts, you know, with, cause the kids can't be back on campus. I just think that, you know, whenever we can open up and play or train, uh, that's probably the, the correct word to say is train is, is more important uh, since we, you know, we haven't had much time to do anything like that. So I, I would try to take advantage of any and all time that I can, given what the NCAA governs us to do. Yeah. As far as my opinion, uh, you know, for training and training and, and 
and the six week lead in or whatever we call that period of time, they're two different entities. And right. I don't believe that uh, players that have the availability and the opportunity to trade should be, uh, that should be withheld from them. I think, you know, it's everything's in the best interest of the players, in my opinion. Uh, there's imbalances and inequities all across the board of the NCAA, I mean, facility wise, recruiting bases, nothing's really equal when, when you really look at it. And so I would hate to see athletes just sitting around that you could be training and getting ready for the season. Uh, just because uh, other places aren't quite yet to that point. Now, the other side of that is I think that, you know, the lead in time to the season needs to be the same. You know, if you get six weeks, uh, seven weeks, whatever, I think that needs to be uh, mandated. But uh, I just don't like to see athletes that uh, would have the opportunity and have the clearance and the go ahead have to sit around and wait uh, just because of where they live. And like I said, there's, you know, we could debate all day long how much inequity there is in, in college football. And, and uh, you know, that's just my opinion.